Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Bology. Manage and measure your player's skill development and increase accountability year-round utilizing the Bology app. Boost inter-squad competition with drills backed by the National High School Basketball Coaches Association, including a 40-shot Bology skills assessment. Please visit Bology.com slash teams for information on how you can provide this resource for your team. So at first, tell me kind of what you're up to these days. Well, uh, professionally speaking, um, my full focus is on growing my speaking business. And, uh, you know, most people label what I do as a motivational speaker. And I know what they mean by that, but I I don't really believe it's my job to motivate others. I, hmm. I certainly think um, a certain level of motivation uh, is incredibly helpful in generating momentum. And, and I certainly want to have a level of inspiration in the way that I deliver stuff. Um, but because of my basketball and coaching roots, um, I consider myself much more of a practitioner, you know, instead of just trying to to motivate folks, which can wear off fairly quickly, as we all yeah. know. Uh, my goal is to provide um, practical, actionable, tangible strategies and principles that people can actually implement and then do the best I can um, to help hold them accountable and support them as they go through that journey. So uh, most of my work now is in the corporate space as a corporate keynote speaker. But the principles that I'm sharing aren't any different than what I shared when I was in the basketball world. And, you know, the the same ideologies and methodologies that I was preaching to players and coaches is the same type of stuff that I'm sharing in the corporate world because there's so much transfer between the two. And um, and there's so much that folks in business can and should learn from folks in sport. So uh, I'm having a blast doing it. Um, for me, an ideal year would be to do 50 to 60 speaking engagements per year. So that averages about one per week, um, which is the perfect pace for me to still maintain some semblance of balance, uh, prioritize yeah. my self-care, be present with my children when I'm home. Um, so I found that's a pretty good pace. And then the books that I've written, uh, Raise Your Game and Sustain Your Game, um, are basically tools to help support the speaking business and find a low-cost, scalable way to share some hopefully helpful information um, occasionally I get back to my basketball roots and I do something in the game, um, which is always a real treat. You know, I, as much as I've enjoyed this transition and, and as much as I can say it is one of the best decisions I've ever made, I still miss the relationships with the players and coaches and doing those cutting edge clinics. So, um, it's been a great journey so far and I'm just having a blast. I mean, it's, it's really an incredible example of being able to pivot and and take because you always I mean, you were such a talented communicator. That was one thing that that I took away from any of the videos that I was able to watch or when you were here in front of coaches and athletes is just golly, like I want to be able to talk to players and, and captivate a group like you do. And but then to see to get to see you use it now in another, like you said, to to non sports specific groups and businesses. That's really cool. And I think it's inspiring for us as coaches to get to see like we can still love the game, but what other gifts do we have? What other ways can we affect change in other people? And it's just been, uh, yeah, I guess I keep using the word inspiring, but I think that's what it's been for me watching you do that. Oh, well, I appreciate that more than you know. It's been a lot of fun for me. Um, you know, there's certainly been some nuanced differences um, between being in a gym with, let's say, 100 eighth graders and being in a boardroom with 15 executives while the the pillars don't really change, um, the way that you communicate and the delivery mechanisms certainly uh, do have some nuance to them. But that's part of what I enjoy. You know, I, I part of what I enjoy is, is figuring out the best way to deliver a sticky and impactful message to a variety of different groups. And you know, I think one lesson to pull on is that that you really just mentioned there very insightfully is you know communication is one of the most important tools we have in our toolbox. Uh, as educators, as teachers, as coaches. Um, so any investment one can make in leveling up their ability to articulate their perspective and to communicate with others is a very sound investment. And, you know, yeah. there's been a few things that I've found that have been very helpful. Uh, one is learning to communicate through story. You know, story is what sways emotion and emotion is what dictates people's behaviors. 
So if you want your players to think and act and feel differently, one of the best ways to do that is to teach and coach through story. And it doesn't have to be this big theatrical five minute production. A story could be a 30 second lesson that you learned, you know, uh, with one of your children or, you know, you had an experience at, at, at a grocery store and there's a lesson to learn from it. But I think anytime we can connect it to a story, it will attach it to emotion, which will then make it more memorable, will make it stickier, but most importantly, will get people to act. And everyone listening to this right now, regardless of your age, like you have a ton of stories that could be impactful and you just have to consistently try to mine through them and mine through your memory and figure out things that you can share. Uh, another thing that I found is as a communicator, we want to be crystal clear um, in what it is that we're trying to, to share. You know, uh, ambiguity is going to fog the, the reception of that message. And if we speak in kind of generalities and we're very vague, then the response is going to be general and vague as well. So the mm -hmm. more clear and precise we can be, uh, the better. And I know coaches understand that, you know, coaches are usually the masters of detail. You know, when you're telling a, a young player how to improve their footwork or their shooting mechanics, the more precise you can be on what it is that they need to do, the better the response. Uh, and then in addition to being clear, um, and this is one, it's funny that I'm rambling on with this long message, but the other thing we need to do <laughs> is we need to learn how to be concise. We need to learn how to trim the fat you know, only say what needs to be said so it doesn't get lost in the in the message. Clearly something I still need to be working on. But, you know, I've learned that, um, and, and I guess we'll use this vernacular. If you can learn to coach in tweets instead of coaching in blogs, that's good. You're much better off. And keep your points as succinct as possible. Uh, I've found that there's something I like to call the rhythm of three, that when you teach something in threes, you know, three quick bullet points or three things to do with your footwork. When you teach them in threes, once again, they become more memorable and stickier. There's something about teaching and coaching in threes that is inherent to the human ear. And we tend to respond very fav favorably to that. So those are just a few things that anyone can use to become a more effective communicator. And last thing I'll say is, you know, communication like leadership is one of those overarching skill sets that helps you in every area of your life. Yeah. You know, being a better communicator will make you a better parent, will make you a better spouse, will make you a better teacher, will make you better at whatever your vocation is. So that's why any investment you can make in becoming a better communicator is a very sound investment. Man, so many golden nuggets right there. Uh, not many players or students going to college have, are planning on or have a dream to be a speech communications major. But I want to tell any any player or even a, a parent that listens to this, a coach that has a kid and their kids are undecided. I, I went to Baylor having no clue what I wanted to do besides playing basketball. In fact, when it was time to pick a major, I went to the seniors on the team and said, guys, what do you do? Like, what should I choose? And they said, oh, speech communications, no homework. It's the easiest one that you can do. And so I signed up for that. And, and But you know what's funny is I had no clue at the time that I would end up being a teacher being a coach, uh, uh, doing anything like this. But in my life, I can't think of something I've used more than the small group classes, obviously get have, learning how to stand in front of somebody, control the words that you're saying, because those filler words, um, uh, er, uh, like those are hard to take out. And I'm going to do a ton of them today with our talk. But then also interviewing, like having to sit in front of somebody and give eye contact and sell to them why you all of that I learned in a in a major that I chose just because I had no clue what I wanted to do. But if they could if people if they don't know what to do or they're not sure what that with the direction they want, man, I can't think of a place to go where, like you said, it can impact your life uh in so many ways. Oh you, yeah. So true. I mean that. The key is figuring out the handful of, of skill sets and mindsets that have the highest utility, because those are things that you can apply to anything you want to do in life. I mean, I went from being a basketball player to a basketball performance coach to now a corporate keynote speaker. And while I'm absolutely loving what I'm doing now, I can't predict the future. I don't know what it is that I'll choose to do 5, 10, 20 years from now. But whatever it is that I decide to pivot to, if I decide to pivot, I can promise you that these skill sets that I've been working relentlessly on during the unseen hours for most of my life, 
they'll be able to apply to any of these future areas. So that's why working on your self-awareness, working on your leadership, working on your ability to communicate, you know, working on your ability to sell, uh, whether it's selling a product or selling an idea, working on your ability to solve problems, uh, working on your ability to embrace the process. If you can spend time in each of these different areas, whatever it is that you choose to do uh, in your career or even in your personal life, um, you'll reap the benefits of that for sure. That's good. And you, you talked about that rule of three. It's funny. Uh, dir I directed for PGC for about five years during the summer. And I thought I was getting into that their program because I played, because I went to, I was a PGC grad in high school with Dick DiVenzio. And so I knew the culture already. You know, maybe my knowledge is why I thought I was getting hired on there. They took me through communication training. And they use those groups of three. So I think to your point, a challenge for us coaches is look at the systems and things that you want to put in place with your team and simplify, bring them down and have sticky language that the players will remember. But like take, for example, ball screens. That's what we're kind of this time of the year. We're trying to implement and go through some things. You and I probably have 18 different ways that we can talk about, teach, remind, give little pointers about ball screens. But we need to get it down to three. And it needs to be something simple and sticky and memorable that players will be able to actually do in time. And we can't confuse them. And I think you nailed it. So with your speaking, that rule of three, I got to imagine that's huge. Oh, it is. And, you know, this just reminds me of something I, I preach from stage and I preach on page. And that is uh, complexity undermines execution. You know, the more difficult we make things, the less likely they are to get done or to get executed on at a high level. So I want coaches to think about that as well. You know, if if you're taking so much pride in, in, in having a playbook that's this thick and you've got 72 different ways that you can guard or use a ball screen, there's a chance your players aren't going to do any of them, you know, because there's that paralysis by analysis. So one thing I've learned is I've continually gotten older and gotten more life experience. I'm 47 years old now. Every successive year of my life, I've tried to simplify things. You know, it's not about I'm at a point in my life. It's not about adding. It's more about subtracting and taking away the things that aren't adding value, the, the things that are being unnecessarily too complex. So I live a simpler life today than mm. I did five or 10 years ago. And yet I actually live a more fulfilled and more successful life today than I did five or 10 years ago. And it's not by accident. You know, it's it's also that uh, and I'm sure I'll butcher it a little bit, but it's that that Bruce Lee quote, you know, about, you know, he doesn't fear a man that can do 10,000 10, different kicks. He fears a man that can do one kick 10,000 times yeah. uh, or something along those lines. It's the same concept. You know, as my children are getting older and I do a little bit of stuff with them on the court, you know, I have uh, 13 year old twin sons and 11 year old daughter. And I keep explaining to them, you don't need to have every move on the and one mixtape tour. You know, if you have a good in and out move and a good in out crossover, so you've got a move and you've got a counter. If you work on mastering that, there's very few high school players that will be able to guard you uh, off the dribble. And same thing from a triple threat standpoint. If you can catch and shoot or you can catch pump fake one dribble and shoot those two moves, a move and a counter can make you a pretty elite level player. So you don't need to have a thousand moves in your arsenal. You need to have a handful of moves and counter moves that you do very, very well. And as you work towards mastery of those, I'm not saying that you can't add other layers and you can't add some more advanced techniques that will all come in time but only once you've mastered some of those basic fundamental moves. And, you know, it's it's hard to get kids to buy into that uh, because they're always watching the NBA. And you, you see somebody like Stephen Curry, who is yeah. a borderline magician with the ball and can do a million different things. Um, but I'm sure when he started, he was only able to do one or two things really, really well. And then he starts to build from that. And I think I think we as coaches hurt players in that because not only are – we know that they need to be good at a few things, like really good at a few things and have answers to problems like you talked about. But then how often like you, I didn't want to throw skill trainers under the bus because there's some really good ones out there. And But as high school coaches, we need to be their skill trainers too, because we see them every day. But if I give them a skeleton, like this is say a triangle drill, but I'm adding three to five 
different moves and reads and things they can do, I'm adding to the confusion or to the belief that they need to have 18 things prepared when you're right on the money. The game is so fast. Life is so fast. You need to be able to see a problem and have one to two solutions to that problem. But I find that sometimes we're the problem. Yeah, it's uh, what do they say? The the, the game is overcoached and undertaught. Um, and there's there's some truth to that. And once again, you know, I have so much respect and reverence and compassion uh, for coaches in particular. I mean, teachers as well. But, you know, I mean, coaches, especially at the youth and high school level, we can all acknowledge you're not doing it for the money. They're doing it for the love of the game. They're doing it because they love the game. They're doing it because they love pouring into young people. They do it, you know, for a variety of reasons, all of which are incredibly altruistic and, and noble. Um, and I say that, you know, many of the ones that are doing way too much coaching and making it way too complex, I know that they're they're trying to do it for the right reasons. Their intentions are golden, but as with most things in our lives, and myself included, we can get in our own way. And you know, um, I had a I had a, a friend tell me when I first started getting into this line of work, and I was doing a lot of writing. Um, his advice for me, he said, "Alan, let's say you're writing a blog post. Here's what I want you to do every time. I want you to write the blog post, even if it takes you a couple of days." Before you publish it, I want you to sleep on it. And the next morning, no matter what, I want you to cut 20% from it. Wow. And I promise you that final blog post will be more impactful and more meaningful and will actually have a, a give a, a more of a punch when you can take stuff away. It's all about getting rid of the extraneous filler that's not necessary. And, you know, I, I don't do that to the mathematical level of 20%, but I do for every single piece of content I put out. The last thing I do is say what words or what sentences or what paragraphs are unnecessary to making this point and let me trim that. And I bring that up because I think coaches should have the same approach. You know, go through your playbook. practice plan, practice, practice plan. That's plan. what I thought about exactly when you said that. Absolutely. Go through a playbook or go through a practice plan and ask what of this stuff is unnecessary to us having an elite level practice. And it doesn't mean you have to get rid of 20%. Maybe you just get rid of one drill or you get rid of one portion of practice that isn't necessary to where you're trying to go. And, you know, I've always been a believer too that as coaches, we should be looking to do the minimal amount possible to get the maximum response possible. So I want to say that again, because I don't want that to be taken out of context. Do the minimum amount possible to get the maximum result. Meaning, if I can get my players to that next level in a 90 minute practice, then I don't need to have a two hour practice. That would yeah. mean three minutes is unnecessary, extra and fluff. So do the minimal amount you can to get that maximum response. And when I was in the basketball training space, uh, primarily from a performance standpoint, that was always my goal. You know, I figured if I can get my team stronger, in three workouts a week at 45 minutes each, and it takes you and your team four workouts a week for an hour, then my program is vastly superior because I'm way more efficient, assuming we're both getting a maximum response. So we, we have to get out of this ideology that more is better because in most areas of life, more is not better. Even look at like a shooting workout. You know, people say all the time, you know, go in and, and, and make 500 shots, make 500 shots. Well, only if the quality is there. Yeah, only it's dangerous to just think like that. Yeah, yeah. if you're just going casually, as long as their footwork and shooting mechanics are on point, as long as they're taking game shots from game spots at game speed, then by all means, that's fine. But what usually happens with most players, the first 100 shots are crisp and pristine. And then after that, you start to see a little bit of a trail off. And by the time they're taking their 500th shot, it's lacking form. It's lacking passion. It's not very crisp. And, and as Drew Hanlon, one of my all-time favorites would say, when you do that, all you're doing is you're getting good at bad shooting. Yeah. Like you are, re you are emphasizing the wrong thing. So once again, if you have the strength and the focus and the level of discipline to make 500 shots with great form and technique, by all means, keep doing it. But my point is, if you only have the discipline and focus to do it for 200 shots, then that's all you should be doing until you can increase your work capacity. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti Podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.